Welcome everybody to an international webinar co-hosted by Women Cross DMZ and the Fellowship of Reconciliation. We're really honored to be partnering with um, FOR, Fellowship of Reconciliation, for this really important and timely uh, webinar about the new South Korean president. As we all know, Moon Jae-in was elected yesterday um, by a pretty landslide. He um, I think 42, 41% of the vote, um, 33 million South Koreans voted, and uh, he had almost doubled the amount of the second largest, um, uh, with the second, the second um, presidential candidate, the conservative. And so it's quite a significant um, turn of events, obviously, for not just South Korea, but um, the entire Korean peninsula. Um, he came into office, or he, the whole presidential election process um, was the result of incredible organizing by mass social movements that um, staged weekly candlelight vigils uh, starting in the fall to challenge um, President Park, who um, was later impeached. But it was really the incredible organizing and steadfast commitment by people. And so I think that uh, this presidential election and Moon Jae-in's um, victory is, uh, is quite a significant um, demonstration of what people power can do. And it's, I think, a, a bright light uh, and incredible hope for democracies around the world and, and for what people, ordinary people, could do. So, um, I'm Christine Ahn, I'm the International Coordinator of Women Cross DMZ. As many of you know, we organized a historic crossing from North to South Korea across the demilitarized zone in 2015, which was the anniversary of Korea's division by Cold War powers. And um, we, this is our second webinar, and it is an international webinar. We have people signed in from the UK to Canada, um, all, all across the United States, Japan, um, and obviously South Korea. And we're really honored to be doing this with Ethan, who I'm gonna hand it over to, to introduce the panelists. But before I do, I just wanted to um, quickly thank Jacqueline Wells, who's our, inner, uh, who are, who's our communications coordinator, who has done tremendous work behind the scenes to make this possible. And, um, and to let you know that we will go till 9.30. We have um, a round of questions that we've prepared for the panelists. Um, but you should uh, type in your questions into a chat box. And if you look um, on your bottom screen, you'll see a little bubble that says chat, and that's where you can type in your questions. So let me now hand it over to my co-host co and co-moderator, Ethan Vesley flad Thank you so much, Christine. Um, uh, it's a great privilege and honor for the Fellowship of Reconciliation to be uh, co-hosting this important webinar on this historic date, really, um, in, in partnership with Women Cross DMZ. Um, and we are delighted to be gathering such a rich group of um, speakers and presenters to talk on this topic at this really critically important time, both in terms of what's happening in the Korean Peninsula, as well as here in our country, where there's such historic things happening in Washington right now, and the ways that they will be impacting Asia and the world. Um, so thank you so much, Christine, and your team for uh, joining us uh, together in this way. Um, the Fellowship of Reconciliation um, is the oldest interfaith peace and justice organization in North America. Um, we are the US branch of a global uh, FOR network, um, and uh, we're just delighted uh, with, with, with branches around the, the world, although not on the Korean Peninsula. Um, and um, these issues have been long ones that have been deeply uh, much a uh, part of our work since our earliest days in 1914, 1915 of working to resist militarism and support the rights of conscience and resistance to war. So uh, given this long history of working for nonviolence and peace and justice, um, we are excited to have these four speakers uh, today presenting from, um, uh, I think, across 13 time zones, <laughs> I think, as Christine said. Um, and I will introduce each of them briefly, and then we're going to move into um, their presentations. So our first speaker today is Tim Shorek, who is a journalist on U.S. foreign policy 
on national security and intelligence and East Asian politics. He is a frequent contributor to The Nation magazine, which probably many people on this webinar are uh, readers of. Um, he's the author of the book Spies for Hire, The Secret World of Intelligence Outsourcing. And he is most revered um, in, in many of our networks uh, for his reporting on how the U.S. government um, helped South Korea's military put down uh, South Korea's democratic spring in Gwangju. Um, so, Tim, welcome to the program. We're delighted to have you. Our second speaker will be Gayun Beck, um, who is the coordinator of the Peace and International Solidarity Team for the People's Solidarity for Participatory Democracy, uh, known uh, throughout the uh, South Korea as PSPD uh, and in activist circles. It's South Korea's largest civil society NGO, and it played a very central role in organizing the candlelight vigils that Christine spoke to earlier that led up to this uh, extraordinary uh, moment that we're in right now. Um, and the impeachment of Park Gun hee and, and ushered in these presidential elections yesterday. Welcome, Gayun. Simone Chun uh, will be our third speaker. Uh, she's an international scholar, activist, and a lecturer at Northeastern University, um, based in Boston. Her work on critical issues facing South Korea has been widely circulated, including in the Hankyore and Kyunghyun Shinmun. She's on the steering committee of the Alliance of Scholars Concerned About Korea, and uh, I believe she's joining us today from the Pacific Northwest in Seattle. Welcome, Simone. And our final presenter today is uh, Doug Hostetter, who is the director of the Mennonite Central Committee UN office um, and a former executive director of the Fellowship of Reconciliation. Doug has worked in numerous countries, including Vietnam, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Bosnia, Afghanistan, and Iraq, and has been involved in citizen diplomacy efforts with the former USSR, Cuba, Bosnia, and Israel, Palestine. Uh, the Mennonites have a long history of humanitarian engagement, over 20 years of, of that work with the DPRK, with North Korea, including most recently, just last week, a track three dipl diplomatic trip of North Koreans to Canada, uh, which Doug was uh, part, part of. Welcome, Doug, to the webinar. Thank so you. now I'm going to turn it back to Christine um, to uh, lead into our first speaker, Tim Shork, with uh, initial questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ethan. So lovely to have you. Um, so we're going to start with Tim Shorak, who is the journalist who actually is based in Gwangju. He was given an honorary citizenship by the people of Gwangju. And he actually has a piece in the nation. He has one of the few exclusive interviews with the new president, and it's up on the nation. And so um, Jacqueline can share that on the chat. Um, so the first question to Tim is, what happened yesterday? And what is the significance of Moon Jae-in being elected? Tim, I think you might be on mute, so maybe unmute yourself. Okay, I'm, I'm, mute. I'm good, okay. What okay. happened was a tremendous <laughs> victory by Moon Jae-in. It's the largest margin in Korean presidential history of its elections. Uh, the next candidate who had about 20 percent compared to his 40 percent was the right-wing conservative who was running. Uh, so he has kind of a mandate from the South Korean people here, although a lot of people were hoping he would get 50 percent, which would help him in his, in his governance. But he won by a smashing margin, and I think in my interview with him, uh, which was on Sunday night after a rally here in Gwangju, he made to me he made very clear to me that he sees his election as the result of this movement of the candlelight revolution, as he calls it. And he it's historic because uh, as he himself traced Korea's history, you know he sees this as a continuum of Korea's movement toward democracy, starting in 1960 when the people overthrew Sigmund Rhee, its first president, an autocratic president who, who uh, was one of the you know, participants uh, who helped you know, really trigger the Korean War and uh, who was overthrown by people angry about his authoritarian practices. And he traces it 
through from that to the Park Chung Hee period uh, in the late late 1970s, October 1979, when in his city, Pusan, there was a massive uprising by students and workers. A lot of people don't know about this, uh, but this was this was a huge uh, uprising against Park Chung Hee's dictatorship. And in the middle of this revolt, Park Chung Hee was shot to death by the head of his own KCIA, and this led to a period of of uh, uh, you know mass movements pushing for democracy, but in the background, a, another general took over, uh, Chen Duhan, and this led to the Korean Democratic Spring, and which led then to the de declaration of martial law and the next part of his continuum, which was the Gwangju uprising. And he, where as was just mentioned, uh, the people rose up and the U.S. helped. Uh, put this revolt down. Uh, and then, you know, he goes all the way through 1987 when the democratic movement managed to win their full democracy here in South Korea until today in the candlelight revolution. So I think that's, you know, he sees himself as part of this movement. And I think that's very important for people to understand. Uh, this is not just a regular kind of political presidential campaign, but a people's movement and that, that it reflects that. Um, and I think it's very significant that he started right away with a bang by saying, you know, he would go to North Korea, he would go to Washington, he'll do anything to bring peace to the Korean Peninsula. And uh, I, think, I think this is a really strong ray of hope for all of us, uh, because as we know, the tensions have been, you know, decrease, increasing. And, you know, many people think there could be a war any day. And he's stepping into this with a determination to use negotiation and, and peaceful ways of, of, of res resolution, such as economic uh, exchanges and cultural exchanges, to bring a negotiated peace to Korea. And he's already started by appointing pro-engagement pro people to his government. And uh, I think it's a real, it's, it's a new day. And uh, I think with the backing of the mass movements here, uh, he can accomplish a lot of what he wants to do in terms of uh, the, the very deep problems facing South Korea economically and politically. And uh, so like he's, you know, he's been talking a lot about youth unemployment, you know, the need to bring jobs and new kinds of jobs to South Korea, uh, about alleviating the strains on working people, uh, improving uh, health care, improving uh, daycare for women who work, uh, and, and uh, also reforming the government's uh, prosecution system Right now, uh, South Korea still has kind of authoritarian laws around uh, how people are prosecuted, and they have tremendous power. And so that's going to be a big focus of his uh, administration as well. And I think uh, he's going to need, you know, support and backing, and you know, sometimes criticism from the mass movements here. Uh, and because he's going to come under tremendous American pressure uh, as his predecessor. Uh, the person he worked for in the past came under, No Mu Hyun, uh, you know, not to take these kind of peaceful steps and to be more militaristic in his approach to North Korea. So, you know, I think we have to, you know, be really uh, full of joy about what's happened here, but we also have to be wary of, of the, the challenges he, he faces and the Korean people face. Great. Ethan? Thank you so much, Tim. That is a really powerful grounding for us. And I want to, again, encourage all of our watchers on the webinar to utilize the chat function that Christine spoke to earlier. Um, we've seen at least one person start posting now as a way to both ask questions and be in conversation with one another about this. Um, we're going to move now to Gayun. And, and I think, Gayun, that was a really important lead in to um, to, to you as we looked at this history that Tim provided of decades of people power uh, struggle uh, in South Korea. And uh, with PSPD being the largest civil society organization in South Korea, as we spoke to earlier, and which played this critical central role in leading the candlelight movement, what's the feeling right now uh, in the wake of yesterday's election on the ground among the South Korean people? And for you, what does uh, Moon presidency mean for the issues that, um, the, that the progressive people of South Korea care about the most? 
Um, hi. Um, I would like to first to thank everyone, um, including especially organizers, to prepare this kind of important event to share our views about this new presidential election. Um, as Tim mentioned, and also as President Moon knows by himself, that we call this as a candlelight election. And I myself was also very impressed to, to see that many people came out on the street. Uh, we had almost like 20 candlelight demonstrations, um, almost like 20 weeks nonstop. And we saw so many people holding candles every weekend in this cold weather. And trust me, it's really cold in, in, in winter in Korea. Um, so I think that actually brings up this new upcoming election. And uh, I mean, new election. And I think all candidates knew about that one. And that actually reflected in the election result as well. Like everybody was so eager to change the, re the, the government. And um, I'm sorry to the, the President Moon's fans, but then whoever comes out from the progressive party, I think they would be able to win the election because people, everybody was so eager to change, um, to, to see the change in the country. But having said that, I think Moon is, uh, a lot of people are having so much expectation on him. And I think he, if I were him, like the new president will be under so much pressure because he will be starting his um, term from already very unstable, you know, um, situation. You know, a lot of the, the national debt. Um, we didn't have the leader of the country for how many months now? So it will be a very big pressure for him, but at the same time, a good opportunity for him to see how he can actually design the country in the next five years. Um, when he was first elected yesterday, many organizations issued a various statement, including their hopes and wishes on, on, on his new presidency. And of course, I cannot quote everyone's um, the, the, the important statement here, but then if I want to say um, the People's Action for Immediate Resignation of President Park Geun-hye, which is a coalition of 1,500 NGOs, and PSPD also part of that coalition, but then they are the one who actually led candlelight vigil for the for the last 20 times. Um, and their main um, request and their calls to President Moon is the first one is withdrawal of that deployment, which we will discuss more later of this discussion. Uh, but then another thing is focusing on the national domestic issues. And I think everybody's familiar with the Seoul Ferry tragedy, which happened three years ago, and still those uh, the missing bodies are under the sea. Um, and uh, people say that, uh, that one of the priority issues that those coalition identified is to find those missing bodies and also identify truth of the Seoul Ferry disaster. The, another issue is, um, I think some of you may be familiar with the case of Farmer Namgi Baek who passed away uh, during the big protest in 2015 uh, by the police's water cannon um, um, during the protest. So uh, the people called for the, the, the investigation on his case as well. And also the lastly, the thing, the most important thing that people call for is reform of the prosecution's office as well as to end this corruption of these links between politicians and also chebols and also reform the whole society. Of course, solving those individual issues are very important, but I personally think the more important thing for him is to change the system because unless you change the system and structure, this kind of situation will goes on and on and on. About peace as well, like I have a hope that he'll be more um, open for discussion and dialogue, but you, we have to be reminded that all the candidates, all the president in the past, nobody says that they're going to bring war on the Korean Peninsula. Everybody says that they are going to bring peace on the Korean Peninsula. You know, the problem is how and when and in what method. So I think we have to keep an eye on that one. Uh, but then having this kind of people power behind him to elect him as a president, I think it gives him a lot of justification and the power for him to speak up at the international society to bring people's will um, to, to, to the international society when he do these foreign policies and things like that. Um, I think that, that uh, that's how actually people expect on the president and we have five more years to monitor how he is going to work as a president in the future. Thank you. Oh, Gayun, it's so fabulous to have you. And Gayun is is um, calling in from Seoul, and Tim is calling in from Gwangju. So it's just really great. Thank you both for joining us. It's so early in the morning, but um, the kind of feeling that you both evoke and share with with all of us just gives us a taste of 
how the people of South Korea are now feeling. Um, and I want to thank people. Um, I see a few questions that have been posted on the chat room. So after we go through these um, first rounds of questions, we'll, we'll dive right into those. Um, the next question is for Simone, Simone Chun. Um, you obviously, as a political science PhD, have been um, studying very closely all the candidates and, um, and obviously what their platforms are. So tell us, what do we know about Moon Jae-in? Um, and what are the three most important policies or issues he said he would tackle? Simone? Thanks for inviting me and it's, it's a great honor and pleasure to um, to be with all of you and I special thanks to Kristen Ahn. I can't believe that women cross DMG, you know, it has been now it's almost entering third years, right? And uh, without you guys, you know, you women have started that, I don't think we would have this forum today. So it's just uh, simply amazing. Um, this is, you know, before even the election, I did, a, uh, uh, I was on interviewed by another radio and uh, was the last week I said this is going to be a watershed um, election uh, and political scientists will use this as a um, critical juncture right? using their political science jargon it means that the election which will not only uh, shape the direction of a Korean Peninsula and also the not the Northeast Asia and also in fact the rest of the world uh, for for the next I think 10 or 20 years so I think this is a huge, huge uh, historic um, moment that uh, all of us uh, are experiencing. And so there are the big, I think, most important one coming from this election, uh, which now in Jae -in, Moon Jae-in, President Moon Jae-in, is the uh, center is legitimacy, right? The kind of legitimacy that the uh, Koreans, uh, pr uh, his prede predecessor Park Geun-hye did not have. Uh, legitimacy that was basically empowered, as as the guy you mentioned, it was by the um, candlelight uh, um, protest, candlelight revolution, where one in uh, three Koreans participated for more than almost like six months. So that is, I think, huge. So um, you know, Moon Jae-in has a huge problem challenges that faces right now. But I think it is the very the people's power. Uh, that has, you know, sustained for the last uh, six months is going to be basically the most powerful um, uh, source that will make him, I believe, I think it's going to be very successful. So um, the first, if you look at it, instead of a sort of a, um, uh, guessing uh, what kind of problem, that, what kind of uh, policies that he's going to implement, let me look at the first thing that he did, actually. This is from, I'm reading the uh, title of the uh, um, uh, news here. It says, a uh, new South Korea president votes to address North Korea, broader ish tensions. The very first thing he did was, in fact, as, as a team mentioned in the very beginning, he appointed, uh, he made a two key appointment in the cabinet. The first one is obviously his um, uh, prime minister, right? Who is the prime minister, who is, who is uh, Lee Na Won, who is a veteran liberal politician, who, was, who had the experience in engaging with North Korea between 2000 and 2007. Um, and also, he is named the um, the uh, head of a, ch a national intelligence service, right? The nom the, the person who uh, Moon Jae nominated was also had extensive experience in uh, in in, in uh, uh, engaging with North Korea uh, during um, under the Roman Yun administration. So what that means is that Moon Jae, I think he's going to make a very swift, bold, and very um, uh, uh, a brave initiative. I think he's going to move very fast uh, with regard to engaging North Korea. So that's the sign that he already, it's a very clear. Now, yesterday I was one of a uh, uh, rather well known political scientist uh, tweeted and said, he said, it's Nick, because Moon Jae said he's going to, in his uh, inaugural address, he said he's going to, you know, visit, he's willing to visit North Korea, uh, Pyongyang. And uh, this fellow have also who's a, um, a political scientist. He said, "Isn't it kind of too early?" You know, <laughs> on the inaugural address, he already saying that he's gonna visit Pyongyang. So I kind of responded to his appeal and said, "You know, I don't think it's, I disagree. I think this is the right thing to do. Right? It's right now we have in the sort of vacuum of leadership with regard to the uh, policy with North Korea. Trump is busy with his own problem dealing with, and uh, China is also somewhat I feel that is not taking sort of a proactive approach. I think this is the really the right time that Moon Jae-in should uh, take his bold initiative. And I think that people will be behind it. And moreover, something that I think we should all remember, that is, you know, when Park Geun-hye was elected in 2012, 
You remember the atrocious politics that she, she talked about, which was hugely popular? What that was, it was engagement policy again. Park geun was elected specifically to change Lee Myung-bak's hardline policy, right? So this was, a, so what I'm saying is the Korean, pop, um, majority of Koreans have not changed their mind with regard to North Korea. They always, always, always supported engagement. No doubt, right? I would say from, from 50 to 70% of people have always supported, right? Engagement. So this, there's nothing new. I, I think that nothing that Moon Jae has suggested, in, even going back to Sunshine Policy engagement is new. So we always have, there's always sort of uh, support. So what something new is precisely the one that I mentioned is that uh, he now has the kind of powerful legitimacy that uh, his predecessor uh, did not have. Um, another one, I think the, the problem that he's going to take, I think it's about the um, uh, foreign policy. I think he, we're going to see, uh, again, Moon Jae-in, who is, uh, uh, who is going to be rather very, very active in international relations and foreign policy. And he's going to create, I think, most competent foreign policy team. He's already have, he has thought about for, I think for, for many, many years. Uh, this is not the kind of president who's gonna say, are we gonna, so president let's gonna take six months to, you know, have a policy review and, and recruit people. No, he, he already has all the team. And I think he's gonna have a most, more competent foreign policy team than either Donald Trump or, or any other country that uh, we have surrounded. So that's a good news. I think the third uh, problem, so he's going to probably do very active diplomacy with the China, and, um, United States, and, and as well Japan. And I think there's a good chance he's going to succeed. I think the third issue that he's, he's going to do is obviously domestic issue, which probably not so much uh, relevant in this particular forum. But I think he, he's, uh, he's, uh, he probably does something that uh, some of people who work for him has in mind is sort of um, uh, Roosevelt, who has a uh, sort of a, a progressive, uh, uh, long uh, progressive years, which led sort of foundation for America's sort of a, a, a progressive um, era. So some people, uh, so he's gonna uh, try to consolidate some of those uh, center left or progressive uh, uh, um, power base. So those are the three issues that I see that this President Moon Jae-in is going to do. I think there are a good chance that he is going to succeed. The only variable will be that uh, we, not only uh, people from uh, outside of Korea and also but inside Korea will have to uh, uh, remain vigilant and more mobilized than ever. And I think we have to do candlelight um, revolution 2.0. Thank you, Simone. That is a, a significant way to end that, uh, with the looking forward to that piece. Um, and now I think we want to move and again build off of your comments as we invite Doug Hostetter into the conversation. Um, and Doug, um, uh, Simone just told us that she expects uh, swift and bold action um, from Moon um, presidency and his administration with respect to North Korea. Um, you have just spent the past week in the company of a delegation of North Koreans um, in, in Canada, uh, in Manitoba, and maybe elsewhere. Um, and uh, so I wonder if you could share some of that experience of what their thoughts are as they looked ahead toward this election day um, uh, and the prospects for um, track three diplomacy being a part of that. And uh, far be it from for you or anyone on this panel to try to peek into the head of Trump, as uh, Simone just <laughs> gave some reference to. Um, no, none of us can really predict what's going to come out of the president from minute to minute, um, per se. But as somebody who works in the United Nations uh, community um, as an NGO representative, I wonder if you could speak a bit about U.S. foreign policy toward um, North Korea and South Korea in the wake of this historic election. Okay, um, just um, a bit. I come from the Mennonite Central Committee, and um, the Mennonite Central Committee is a an organization that has been doing um, relief development and peace work around the world. We work in about 50 countries, um, but we've been working in North Korea uh, for the last 20 years. We started actually in the mid-90s um, when there was a real famine there, and we were doing just um, just relief work, uh, sending tons of um, wheat and 
soy and other things grown by Mennonite farmers in North America to help people who were in desperate need. When that ended and most of the NGOs left North Korea, um, the Mennonites were actually invited to continue working uh, in more um, development kind of work. So we have been doing small projects, um, nutritional support for uh, 12 different orphanages all across uh, North Korea. And then um, in the last five years, we've had um, uh, sustainable agriculture projects with um, three collective farms in North Korea. Uh, basically trying to help them to farm better, more economically, uh, be pro more productive, uh, use less um, commercially uh, bought seeds and fertilizers and use more um, sustainable agricultural uh, processes. But in addition to this, the Mennonites work on this basically because we believe that peace and dialogue is the best way in every situation. Um, so we have also tried to foster communications and dialogue between North Koreans and Americans um, in a variety of ways. Um, we have, um, uh, in New York, I've worked with some Korean American artists in New York in the uh, Korean Art Forum. And in the last four years, we've done four major exhibits of North Korean, South Korean, Russian, and Chinese art. Um, giving uh, American people a chance to meet uh, Koreans through culture. Um, uh, we are also uh, planning this summer to bring four North Korean artists to uh, New York for one month um, to paint uh, on the streets of New York, uh, to do um, uh, a major exhibit at the end and do several um, artist talks and things like this. And we, uh, as a way also of uh, saving money and also um, promoting dialogue, we've gone around to uh, Korean restaurants here in New York and asked them whether they would be willing to give uh, a free meal to uh, uh, poor North Korean artists when they're through this summer. Um, we've also reached out to the South Korean Mission to the UN Consulate and said, um, uh, we are doing this. We wanted them to learn it from us before they learned it from the State Department. Uh, we also wanted their pledge that they would not harass um, Korean restaurants who gave um, meals and hospitality to uh, North Koreans who were coming through. Um, this last week, uh, the Mennonite Central Committee is a binational organization. Um, uh, stationed both in Canada and the U.S. And this has been somewhat confusing for the North Koreans in their relationship with us because for almost 15 years we had a Canadian as the director of our North Korean program. And we were treated in North Korea as a Canadian organization. And then uh, two years ago, um, that staff person returned to Canada and was replaced by um, an American from North Carolina. And um, this was very confusing to the North Koreans uh, because they had treated us as a Canadian organization. Um, and so we have been trying to help them to understand that we are a binational organization. We have Canadians and Americans, um, which has been somewhat of a, somewhat difficult for them because um, there are two different organizations in North Korea that, uh, that host uh, American and Canadian organizations. And um, so, you know, there's one organization that hosts Americans who want to do relief or development or peace work there, and another one that hosts Canadians. But there was nobody who could handle the Canadian and American delegation. And um, so often we'll have, you know, a uh, Canadian agriculturalist with. Um, paired with a, an American agriculturalist that will both need to be visiting the same collective farm at the same time to look at dis different aspects of um, um, soil conservation or um, seed production or planting rotation, that kind of thing. 
Um, so in order to kind of help the North Koreans understand better uh, who we are, uh, we invited uh, four North Koreans from uh, Pyongyang to uh, two from the Canadian host organization and two from the organization that hosts Americans. And then we invited one of the diplomats from New York that I work closely with here in New York that is a liaison for the Mennonite Central Committee. And we spent four, day, four days together. It was an amazing time. I just um, put in the chat box a link to a Canadian Broadcasting Company article uh, on our trip. We tried to do it below the radar, but um, somewhere, somehow, someone knew that we had North Koreans there. And um, so we did, uh, we, we did do an interview with our North American staff uh, about the work that we do there, but did keep them further away so that we could kind of keep it uh, low profile. It was, it was really amazing. Um, by the end of four days, I can tell you that we were all family. It was, um, it was really amazing. Um, the warmth, the interaction, the sharing of family photographs. Um, I'll never forget um, a meeting that I had, um, this was actually back about six months ago, from a, an ambassador who had been in New York, who I'd known quite well, who'd been in my home and um, visited with my family, picnicked in my backyard, and um, I had given him a picture of him and his wife standing with me and my wife in front of our house. And he came back um, after being away a couple of years and we met at the UN six months ago and he said, Doug, he said, remember that picture that you gave me of you and your wife and me and my wife in front of your house? And I said, yeah, I said, I, I really like that picture. And he said, you know, I took that back to uh, the Capitol and that's on the wall of my apartment. And he said, my Korean friends, cannot believe that I have an American friend. And I say, yes, I have a very good friend in New York. And he said, even my children can't believe that I have an American friend. So this is the kind of work that we try to do. We try to break down the barriers between the Koreans and Americans. Uh, we try to break down the stereotypes of the Koreans as, um, uh, the demons that are portrayed in all of our media. Uh, we went to one Korean restaurant in a Mennonite community in, um, in Canada. We had not given anybody any heads up before going there. And the, it was just incredible, the chemistry that was happening between these four North Koreans who work for um, uh, agencies that host North American and Canadian and U.S. organizations uh, in their first trip to Canada and meeting uh, Korean Canadians. Uh, and the chemistry was amazing. And I can tell you that after they had had kimchi and a good Korean meal, there were more smiles and more warmth uh, than we had seen in three days. So I can recommend Korean food as a wonderful way to bring people together. Thank you, Doug. Uh, words to, to live by, for sure. Um, and um, we look forward to hearing more about some of the upcoming um, efforts that you referenced that are ongoing in terms of the artistic uh, community and other ways of doing uh, civilian and citizen diplomacy engagement. Um, and I think we're now we're going to move on to the, uh, we have a few questions that both people have been submitting um, through the chat as we invited you. And please keep to using that um, uh, as well as a couple others we had prepared for all the panelists. So Christine, would you like to uh, lead in with our first um, questions to all the panelists? Yes, thank you, Ethan. Um, the first, so we have two questions. One will come from me, one will come from Ethan, and then we'll start with the, the round of questions that we've received on the chat box. And I'll, I also got one via email. Um, but this is um, quickly to all the panelists. Um, what's your opinion of how um, President Moon will handle the sticky situation that South Korea is in um, from the deployment of THAAD um, 
and especially how that complicates South Korea's relationship with China, who has responded by boycotting a lot of South Korean services and goods. Um, how will, you know, I mean, obviously, inter-Korean re reconciliation, we've heard him say he would go to Pyongyang. He, but obviously, um, how right now it's clear that there is a divergence in, um, in approaches in dealing with the North Korean nuclear crisis, where we see um, Trump wanting to take a more hard line and further isolate North Korea, um, though we've seen the whole range from maximum pressure to engagement. Um, to, you know, how, so how is, I mean, he's obviously taking a very, he's, um, as all the panelists have noted, he's in a very difficult spot, um, given especially the political vacuum that has been in place for some time, but it's obviously a tremendous opportunity. I just love everybody to maybe take two minutes to quickly respond your quick, quick thoughts to that, that, that question. Oh, so maybe we'll start with Tim, Kayun, Simone, and Doug. Okay. Well, as he said yesterday, he wants to negotiate. And he said uh, there was actually a very good story by James Pearson, the Reuters correspondent in Seoul last night that, that, that's available now on the internet, where uh, they talk about his, his desire to negotiate with China and the, China and the U.S. Uh, about the THAAD system. Now, he has not come out directly against THAAD, but he has said, you know, he was very upset when the U.S. unilaterally deployed it a couple of weeks ago before, prior to the election because his position was the next government should uh, handle this and, and deal with this. But he clearly wants to negotiate it. And he did say the other day in Guangzhou in a public speech that he wants to renegotiate that with the United States. So I think he would like to, uh, uh, I think his, his desire is to not have that installed and, and perhaps have the U.S. remove it as a step toward, uh, you know, possibly opening negotiations with North Korea. Uh, <clears throat> but I think uh, it's also so, you know, and, and, as, and as Simone said earlier, uh, he has appointed some pro-engagement people, people with experience dealing with North-South issues to his government to very senior positions. So he wants to move on this right away. And so I think, you know, that, that's, all, that's all very good. Uh, I, I think in, in terms of, uh, you know, he's also said, and this is quite significant, has been missed, during the campaign, as people know, uh, may, may not know actually, uh, that there's a joint U.S.-South Korea command here that in times of war is headed by a U.S. general. And uh, that there, there was a, a, there's been a lot of talk here over the last few years about changing that so the a South Korean general is in charge at times of war. And this has been delayed. It was delayed by the Pak uh, government. Uh, and he said he wants to move very quickly to change that arrangement. And so I think actually that's going to be a very tricky issue uh, with the United States because I think the U.S. still wants to keep its control in, 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 this, in times of war. Um, <clears throat> one issue that I brought up in my uh, article uh, with, with, uh, that I just posted with Moon Jae-in was in terms of like lifting, you know, economic exchange, one of the things we have to, we all have to deal with is, is uh, there are these U.N. and U.S. sanctions uh, and globally approved sanctions on North Korea. And so I think when he starts, you know, moving in terms of like certain kinds of incentives, you know, so, uh, providing rice to North Korea in exchange for minerals from North, rice from South Korea in exchange for minerals from North Korea, uh, that some of these may bump against sanctions. So there's going to be have to be work done at the UN and in the U.S. Uh, to to roll back some of these sanctions, so you know, uh, so South Korea can proceed on this path. Um, and I think that that's, you know, that's, that's going to be, that's going to be an issue. Um, but I think he's, he, he wants to move on this and, and wants to move, you know, very, very swiftly. And I think that's what the people in Korea expect. And, and finally, I want to say that I think it's, you know, there, there was a very sort of encouraging side f sign from North Korea the other day, one day before the election, Rodong Shimbun, which is the party newspaper, in North Korea, which you know speaks for the Workers Party, uh, you know 
posted a commentary saying, you know, let's lift the, let's, let's end the hostility. And they were really, you know, they're really very uh, critical of the last two governments in South Korea for being a barrier to peace in South Korea. And so they were certain in, in North and South Korea. And so I think the North, that was a sort of, uh, the North Koreans were kind of making a statement, trying to reach out, I think, to Moon and South Korean people saying, yes, let's, let's, mo let's move on this. And uh, it's going to depend, you know, like, I think what North Korean actions and statements are in the next few weeks and months is going to make a big difference with how Moon proceeds. Uh, you know, he did say also not too long ago that if there was another nuclear test there, that would really be a setback, a, a, you know, test of another atomic device. So, you know, I think, I think that's going to be very, people are going to be closely watching what happens in, in the North and what they do and say, uh, and that's going to make some difference in, in how Moon can proceed in terms of the political room he has here and with the United States. <clears throat> Great. Thanks, Tim. Kai Yoon, your thoughts? Um, well, whenever I hear about these foreign policies around Korea, um, one oldest saying in Korea always comes up to my mind. There's an oldest saying that um, shrimp speck squeezes between the fight of whales. And I think that exactly shows how Korean is situated right now in, in, this, in this international society. You know, do two big superpowers and we're squeezed in between. And to survive from the fight from two superpowers, you have to be very wise and clever. Um, I want to talk about four different issues. Like one is that, that we discuss uh, as a main question and also North Korea, Jeju Island, and also the comfort women issue. I'll be very brief. About that deployment, um, before the presidential election, PSPD sent a questionnaire to each candidate to ask about their position about the THAAD deployment. Um, Moon Jae-in, before the, way before the presidential election, he was against the THAAD deployment very strongly. But by the time that it approaches the presidential election, he slightly changed his position, saying that, oh, I cannot comment anything about uh, deployment of that itself, whether it is good or bad, I'm being neutral right now, but the process itself is not really democratic. So when we have a new government in power, we have to rediscuss about the deployment process. And um, and they, he he answered from the uh, to to us that three priorities to solve the that issue is first of all he's going to prioritize the national interest, which is our economy and also national security, and he's going to focus prioritize about the Korea U.S. alliance and also the negotiation among Korean people. So even though civil society is calling for immediate withdrawal of that deployment in Korea, saying that it is not useful, it's not going to be effective, not justifiable, no negotiation among the people, and also it will harm the, the peace on the uh, Northeast Asia, uh, by having opening a dialogue again about the deployment process of the THAAD will be a good start to discuss about uh, whether we, will, we really need THAAD in Korea or not. I went to Thad, uh, the Songju area, which is, the Thad is going to be deployed a few, a few last week actually, and stayed there for three days. And it is a really, really small village, really small village. I heard that there is only 40 families are living there. And, though, and, and the people who are living there are really, really old. So the other day they brought their um, yellow melon, which is, uh, which is very famous from that region. And they came in front of the US embassy and saying that Mr. Trump, Take this uh, yellow melon. This is really delicious. Please remember that there are people living in Songju. And the letter written by the 76 year old old lady from Songju was really, really um, heartbreaking. And I think that's the thing we have to keep in mind when we think about whether this is really important for the national security or it will be really helpful to, to, to combat North Korea. Apart from that one, I think we have to also think about there are people living in Songju. And I hope that the new president will also remember that one when we reopen the negotiation process about the Thad deployment. And I hope that the parliament and other um, the decision makers um, will think about that one when we discuss about Thad again. North Korea, uh, well, PSP has been calling for the, the unconditional dialogue with North Korea. And we believe that it may sound a bit naive that this is the only fundamental solution to solve North Korean nuclear issues. And we all know that 
during the period the six party is not working properly, we actually gave an opportunity to North Korea to develop, develop their nuclear you know, the capabilities. So that is why we believe that this uh, hardline uh, policies towards North Korea was not effective at all. It was already proven. And it is time for us to think about, again, you know, open a dialogue and negotiation with North Korea. It is very positive for us to see that Moon is open to those dialogue. And also, um, I believe that Moon is going to reopen the, the platform to, 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 um, to have a meet, to arrange, rearrange the meeting of the separated families as well. And having said it, that also starting from this private level discussion, um, you know, the, the private level of uh, meetings and negotiation, like meetings with writers from North and South Korea, meetings of scholars or meetings with artists can be a one way uh, to start a negotiation with North Korea as well. And we will see how it is going to happen in the, in the next five years. Um, I think many people also are aware of the Jeju naval base, um, the, the construction situation. Already the, the naval base is being constructed. Early this year, the U.S. Uh, warship Zoom Oil actually came to uh, Jeju and it docked in the, the naval base for a few days. And uh, the government is now planning to build a, a, a second airport in Jeju, which they insist that this is going to be used as a private use only. But that's what they used that excuse when they decide to build the naval base as well. Um, and we all know that there is a high chance that this base is going, uh, the airport is going to be used as an air base um, in the future. And that is why many Jeju uh, villagers and islanders are protesting against it. Um, even though many candidates and also the president Moon says no, that this is not going to be used as an air base. So that's the thing that we need to also keep an eye on, the Jeju Island, which is a center of U.S. people to Asia strategy, um, to see how the new government is going to deal with this Jeju Island in the future. Uh, finally, the comfort women issue, the old candidates, when we sent a questionnaire to everyone, the five uh, the main candidates, all of them says that um, they're going to nullify the agreement. Uh, but the problem is how and when, so we will see what will happen in the future. The one thing that I can guarantee um, to the international society is that I don't think that uh, President Moon is going to jeopardize the relationship between U.S. Korea and the U.S. Japan. And I think we have to all remember the Ro Hyun period is actually those times when the Korean government decided to uh, dispatch troops to Iraq and also concluded the FTA um, agreement with the U.S. as well. So I don't think that it will, he will uh, jeopardize those international relations with other alliances in the country to push his agenda to North Korea and things like that. So I don't think that uh, the, the U.S. media needs to worry that much about that, you know, the new president will 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 be uh, like uh, go against the U.S. policies and things like that. But at the same time, I believe that he needs to be very wise to not to be squeezed between two big superpowers and um, and to find a wise way to solve this North, uh, North Korean issues. Great, um, and Simone, and if we can just keep our responses to two minutes or under. Okay, so let me be very quick. First of all, um, with regard to sad issue, uh, as, as a previous presenter pointed out, Moon Jae-in said he would like to negotiate with the United States and also China. Um, he has said repeatedly, so he must have something that we don't know about. He must have some faith or something. So I'm, I'm kind of hopeful that he may have, a, a, he, may be, he may succeed in diplomacy or renegotiate with the Trump administration. And I think we should have pointed out that, you know, Trump, this issue of the set is not really either Trump or Moon, President Moon's issue. It was a basic problem in, inherited from their predecessor. So I think for both of them, if they can solve this issue, it will be also good, um, uh, a big uh, political gain. And nobody wants set except those military industrial complex who want to sell the used, uh, if not even brand new set, right? The new set and um, basically sort of illegal parking in, in Sosong, Ni, Songju, and Kimchon area. So I think that that's the, I'm still, I'm, I think there's a good chance that Moon might be able to succeed in doing some kind of deal with the uh, uh, Trump administration, as well as also negotiating, uh, doing something with uh, uh, China. The second is that, um, so, and today I think if I if I'm, uh, remember correctly, a Trump administration already invited um, uh, President Moon Jae-in to visit the uh, United States. So it uh, we may see that he's you know, we may see his uh, uh, visit to the United States very very soon. I think which will be great news. And uh, so uh, once you know Trump 
boasts him, boasts himself as sort of big, uh, sort of uh, good at the business deal. So we may see something coming there. About the North Korea issue, uh, short term, I think I Moon Jae In will probably meet with some kind of uh, 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 again implement swift policies. I think he will open, resume the Kaesong Industrial Park, which Park Geun-hye shut it down. Um, you know, the 50-some uh, business uh, leaders from uh, the, the closed Kaesong Industrial Park uh, strongly supported him and actually, in fact, the other, the whole um, uh, business uh, organization supported him. So I think we're going to see um, the resumption, the opening of a Kaesong Industrial Park. And also, with regard to North Korea, he already said that he's not going to expect any quick uh, magical solution. He said economic integration and also cultural uh, uh, sort of family union, humanitarian issue first, and then hopefully uh, some kind of political reunion in, in the long run. So that's where I think he's going to head into North Korea. And the third thing, a third, uh, the last thing that I would like to um, uh, point it out is that I think Moon Jae-in uh, of all, the, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, he has a very unique opportunity because of the um, enormous uh, mandate and also legitimacy that people have from the, from the Korean people. So I think that we will see, we may see something kind of surprising. Maybe I'm too optimistic today, but that's why I guess I'll stick to it. Okay, great. And Doug, really quickly, Two minutes. Okay, uh, just really briefly, uh, um, my time with the uh, North Koreans in Winnipeg, Canada hap was actually just before the election. So they didn't, um, um, they couldn't react to the election, but I can tell you from my conversations with North Koreans in New York and also in Canada, that they are, they're very hopeful, um, and would like to move back to an area of dialogue and cooperation with South Korea, uh, as has happened in previous eras when there were progressive governments in South Korea. Um, they are very willing to look at this. They, um, they, when we have raised the issues of um, nuclear weapons and um, um, uh, the that issue. Uh, they have always said, they've been very clear that the nuclear weapons is really uh, for their own defense, that they have felt threatened by the military exercises that are taking place and um, the uh, THAAD um, mobilization to South Korea. And when I raised issues of the possibility of, say, a uh, neutralized um, Korean Peninsula that would be uh, demilitarized and and neutral, not members of any uh, coalitions with it, any major powers. Uh, they were very interested in exploring those kind of ideas. Great. Thank you Thanks. all, oh. Ethan. Yes, Christine. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so I think uh, many of you have already spoken to the the lessons from the past of the two progressive administrations that um, preceded this one um, and what uh, what lessons they, they, they provide for today. And I wonder, um, there's been, again, some of you have talked about uh, the role of civil society in terms of some humanitarian aid in track three uh, diplomacy. Are there other ways that you would speak to the, the role of global movements, global Nonviolence, faith-based um, civil society movements, um, particularly those here in the United States, since that's the majority of our audience uh, on this webinar, um, to pushing for um, constructive and deeper engagement toward uh, toward it, the effort by um, the expected effort by the Moon presidency to to seek um, a, a new new way of working. So um, again, we'll come back to you, Tim, to start, um, and if you could talk about uh, what uh, what what we should be seeking and asking for um, from from these global movements in support of the work that's happening on the ground from the South Korean um, movement. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> well, in the United States, I think we need to really continue our education, uh, just basic stuff about what's going on in South Korea. Uh, I was rather amazed when I was on the radio the other day with uh, WNYC in New York, 
uh, you know, speaking to an interviewer who's, you know, very experienced, but uh, his, his first question was, does this mean the South Korean people are rejecting democracy? Uh, you know, thinking like the last two presidents were very democratic. And I, you know, I said, no, it's, act it's the exact opposite. And I had to really reorient the interview. And I, th I just think there's this really basic, you know, lack of information and refusal to understand Korea that we have to overcome in the United States. And I think we're, you know, I think we're, we're getting there. Um, but, you know, the media, the U.S. media is very hostile to both Koreas, I think, South and North Korea. And I think, you know, the peace movement is, I don't even know where the peace movement is broadly in the United States. Uh, you know, there have been some, uh, you know, focus on North Korea because of the war scare in the last couple of weeks. Well, we've got to really continue that. And I think we, we, we you know, we, it, for me, it's, we have to start at the most basic place, which is continued education about the U.S. role here, uh, what, you know, the history of American-Korean uh, relations, the history of the U.S. with North Korea, you know, going, going back to the Korean War. I mean, it's just the, the American um, left, I think, and the, the, the mass movements we have are, are really don't even count Korea much into their calculations about the world. You see far more, you know, focus on, you know, the, in the Middle East, uh, other parts of the world than you do on, on Korea. And uh, there's just this, you know, really big, huge information gap. And so I think before we can really mobilize, uh, we've got to continue this. And I think, you know, forums like this, <clears throat> I think the fact that, you know, Women Cross TMC has really gotten this whole issue of peace out there is really important, and I think it's made made some difference. Uh, but you know, I, I I every time I look at the you know so-called uh, left press and you know read what progressives are writing, I'm just I get depressed <laughs> about Korea, and uh, so I think that's 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 where I'm at. But I think in terms you know understanding the complicated role of the United States here is 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 very important to get across. And the difficulty, as Gayun was saying, navigating for South Korea and North Korea, navigating between you know, these great powers, China, the United States, and Japan. Japan is really becoming much more assertive militar militarily under Abe. And uh, I think you know, the war scare was due also to Abe. I mean, he actually uh, you know, played a big role in making people in Tokyo think a war was going to happen any day. And so you know, I think I think that there's that there's a lot of work that needs to be done on this sort of basic <clears throat> basic education of uh, both media and, and and then you know peace and justice groups about the reality of of life here in in, in Korea. Thank you, Tim. That's very helpful. Um, uh, Gayun uh, and and again, our panelists. Let's try to keep this to two minutes. We now have a whole series of questions we've received, and so we're going to try to get it to as many of your comments and questions that have come in as possible. But Gayun, what are you looking for from your allies internationally um, of, of other movements in support of of your work on the ground? When I hear, like, I completely agree with what Tim says. Like, I remembered in the last presidential election, one of the the the, the person. Uh, director who is working in a very big human rights organization, international human rights organization. I don't want to mention, I don't want to mention which one it was. And then she approached to me and she was like, oh, if you want to solve the problems of North Korean human rights issue, you should support for Park Geun-hye, not Moon Jae-in. Because when Moon Jae-in came into power, then you, are, you will never be able to solve North Korean human rights issue. And she is the head of a very big human rights organization at the international level. And that actually shocked me a lot. That means even those people who are working on North Korean issues on diverse ways, including um, especially on human rights field, are not really aware about this complicated situation um, between North and South Korea. And I think that understanding um, to, to, to raise awareness about how Korean people really feel about this situation, what is this complicated political situation between North and South Korea will be, um, that kind of awareness should be raised among international people. And I also agree that media should play an important role. At the same time, I also um, have to admit that Korean civil society also play an active role in producing our positions 
um, as much as possible in English as well, so that uh, many international readers can and can read about our stories. Um, having said that, if you have any questions, you, you can always reach me to PSPD office um, to get to know what civil society's point of view on North Korea. Um, and, and I think that's a good start uh, from where we can actually mobilize international support to calling for peace on the Korean Peninsula. And, and having said that, I think Women Cross DMZ is also one of a very good um, momentum to, to open that kind of dialogue from the international society. At domestic level, um, I have to say that uh, the civil society will, will, will continue to monitor the new president, um, uh, the, the, the activities in the next five years with a lot of hope and expectation, but at the same time be very critical on his uh, position if it goes against the people's will from the candlelight vigil. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gayun. Well, Simone and Doug, um, uh, one after another, you two are the uh, two speakers based here in the United States. And so again, um, if you could say anything about what you think um, US civil society, who will be the groups uh, and the, the movements here uh, working in support of this? Simone? Yes, um, you know, as I have been teaching um, uh, international relations and also public of Asia uh, in general and Korea, Japan for the last 20 years. And I know, you know, uh, from the ground, I can report to you that the knowledge about special Americans, even you know, in college students about Korea is very limited. And uh, um, so that's, I can share the kind of things of frustration. On the other hand, you know, the when I when I was designing classes, <laughs> surprisingly, you know what, of all the uh, Asia-related classes, uh, politics of North Korea has the actually is, is most popular. American students are most has most curiosity and has most enrollment, right? So what I'm saying is that North Korea, this is the I think I'm taking sort of a business approach, or you can take even the commercial approach. This is a good product. Korea is a good product. North Korea is especially good product. America don't know about it, so that you can sell it. Uh, so I think we have to create uh, some sort of a, um, urgency. Because the, what happened to Korea is that, you know, like forgotten war, Korean, Koreans sort of, you know, it's kind of people that Americans have forgotten about it. So I think that for our, in, in America, uh, I think the team is doing a great job in the media level. And I'm actually, the kind of work that I'm doing is trying to create a sort of a solidarity among uh, intellectuals, uh, uh, students, and also alternative media, uh, and also local organizations. So that's the way I, I, the, the kind of work that I'm doing. So I think we have to keep engaging Americans. So one way to do it is, a, you know, uh, this time we have a great sort of, this is a, the, the Korean election, the candlelight visual, the revolution, the Moon Jae-in, the presidents, this is great products. I think we should sell it, we, we should exaggerate to American people, we should talk forever, you know. Uh, and the second, so it means engagement, right, constantly. So not just one product, we have, a, we should have probably next time think of another event or something that we can sell constantly. So until we have some sort of reach the, the, the momentum for really a, a, a permanent sort of a, a solution to, the, to this tension. And uh, I think this is, uh, 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 that's why we really rely on especially the American um, uh, civil society. And one, most, one last thing I'll mention is that, you know, the Korean Americans are right now really, really mobilized, energized, as a result of uh, for, because of the last four years of disastrous Park Geun-hye administration, especially and also the ASEAN disaster, so this is a really, really the kind of moment moment that we I don't think we ever had uh, in within Korean America in the United States. So there is a, this is an amazing opportunity that we have, we shouldn't squander. Thank you, Simone, so much. Um, okay, uh, Doug, um, any anything to add here? Uh, well, the Mennonite Central Committee is doing a number of things. Um, we are, um, the Canadian Mennonite University in Winnipeg has offered a scholarship to uh, two North Korean diplomats to attend a summer peace building <laughs> course next month and uh, at the Canadian Mennonite University. We first tried to interest them in going to a um, a uh, summer peace building institute at um, Eastern Mennonite University in Virginia, and uh, basically the the North Koreans said no, our, our our government won't allow us to study in in the U.S., but we could study in Canada. Uh, it's a little less dangerous there, but we have also um, we are working with them on uh, sending short-term uh, lectures to do uh, work in uh, in medicine or agriculture in 
some of their universities. We are exploring also offering ex exchange um, um, programs for North Korean students in um, Canadian or Mennonite universities. I should also say that there is a lot of support for peace and reunification kind of things within Protestant churches in the US, uh, kind of buried within the bureaucracy of a lot of American Protestant churches are um, Korean Americans who care deeply about peace. There isn't really a movement, but there are many individuals that if, um, if the momentum is going, I think we can tap on them. Uh, just an example, uh, we had a, um, three weeks ago, there were, was a group of, of South Koreans came from the uh, YMCA, from the Korean Council of Churches and some Buddhist organizations to come to New York and, and Washington to work on uh, protesting THAAD and to talk about the candlelight vigils. And very quickly in New York, we were able to pull together um, uh, prominent leaders from Christian denominations who were interested in coming and meeting with them and learning about uh, the movement that's taking place. So there is potential there. And uh, there are a lot of Korean Americans who uh, could be mobilized um, if we could work well, well and wisely. Thank you. Um, Christine? Yes. Um, okay, so now we're going to try to turn to the questions, and um, I'm going to try to be teacher here and um, assign some questions. So um, everybody just bear with me. So I have one question. This is going to be for Kai Yoon. Um, the question is, Moon Jae-in's victory is a testament to people power for many sectors of Korean civil society. Now that Moon has won, how prepared is the electorate, especially left progressives, to hold him to his promises? For example, to engage North Korea in good faith, reassert South Korean sovereignty. For example, he's promised to end the US control of the Combined Forces Command and reassess that, promote workers' welfare by ending the Chabal government collusion. So it's basically a question about how prepared is civil society um, to basically to hold Moon accountable. So that's the first question. And the second question related to that is about the national security law. And has uh, President Moon mentioned anything about potentially abolishing that law or reforming it, which has obviously played a huge role in maintaining this kind of Cold War mentality on the Korean Peninsula? So Kayum, that's the first question to you. I'm just going to quickly field the questions in the first round to the other panelists, just so that you know what's coming up the pike for you. Tim, the, um, the, the questions for you is from both Gail and David Hart. Um, oh dear. Um, Gail asked uh, a question about Americans. Let me see if I can find it here. Um, she asked about US citizens don't want war and don't want our Trump administration to cause hostility to, ra to raise um, tensions between North and South Koreans. So citizens of the US are becoming more aware of the influence we are having, and we are far more aware of the US military complex pressuring. Um, so if you could respond to Gail's question and also to David's first question, which was, um, I'm just about uh, you know basically South Korea being the shrimp between the two two whales as Guy Yin put it um, between the U.S. and China and um, you know South Koreans feel that they the U.S. needs North Korea as a bad country to justify troops and arms sales to both Japan and South Korea and North Korea needs the U.S. to be the bad guy to keep internal control. So how can Moon cut through all of this and point the way toward real peace and reconciliation? So that's to directed to Tim. And Simone, um, as somebody who has long studied labor politics, um, I think it would be great if you would uh, respond to both Ferdinand Liefert's question, which is um, like, what is the new government's stance towards activists, specifically union activists or pro politicians of the prohibited United Progressive Party who were imprisoned under the former government? And Michelle Chen's question, which is, could you discuss the role of organized labor and labor activists, particularly how they might be involved in any future economic reforms? 
Um, so that's to you, Simone, if you could respond to that. And, and lastly, to Doug, um, there's a question from, let's see, Robert Mayaki Stoner down here. It's, um, I heard on NHK News today that Germany is shutting down a North Korean owned hostel in Berlin. Germans claim that the UN ma mandated this action. Can such action, sanctions be modified? Um, and related to that, Doug, if you could respond, I mean, obviously, uh, one thing that has been put on the table by the Trump administration is trying to get China to cut fuel and oil into North Korea. And just, you know, based on your on the ground experience, how devastating would that be to ordinary people? So sorry, that was quite a, a long lineup, but I wanted to just let everybody know that we are being responsive to the questions and you should feel free to keep sending them in and then we can get to the next round. So we'll start with Gayoon, Tim, Simone, and then Doug. Okay, I hope that I can still remember the questions. <laughs> um, <let> me, <laughs> okay, do you want me to repeat it or you're good? I wrote it down, it's okay. <laughs> uh, let me be very frank. When I talk to my colleagues and other civil society members, some of them remember those period um, under like Kim Dae-jung and Noh Mi-hyun. And surprisingly, they say that actually it was harder for them to work under that administration than working under Lee Myung-bak and Park geun -hye. It's also because many civil society members went into the, the administration. So they became a kind of person who made policies in the government. And of course, they wanted to push for the, the argument that they used to make when they were you know, civil society member. But once they go into the, the, the the, the, the government, and there are some limits to, to, to push for those issues. But then from our point of view, it's very difficult to fight with uh, somebody who pretend to be one of us than a clear enemy. Let me be very frank on this. Um, and I think that will bring a similar challenge under this Moon administration. And I think um, many civil society members can also like worry about that kind of situation will may happen in the future. Um, but was, I think once they, if, if, whether civil society is ready, and I have to say yes, because that has been our role to monitor and then keep raising our voices against the government policies if that goes against us. But then, uh, and I, I, I theoretically, and also I personally believe that we should not be uh, should not be kind of, how can I say, to, to be generous to this progressive government because it's coming uh, from uh, the similar to our policies. Uh, but I think we should be more critical to their position. At one point, we have to support them and then compliment them if they are doing a good job, but at the same time, be very cr critical if they don't actually um, um, the, the keep up with their the pledges that they made before uh, to become a president. And I think that uh, civil society's role is very critical um, in the future to give pressure to the government and keep remind them that you guys are becoming a power because of the candlelight vigil. Um, about National Security Act, it's a kind of long history and I think everybody is well, you know, well aware that this is such a draconian law um, that uh, cracked down human rights defenders and also the people who has a dissent um, opinions against the government. Um, we had five TV debates among presidential candidates. And on the second debate, the one of the conservative party candidate asked Moon Jae-in about his opinion about the, the abolishment of National Security Act. He said that abolishment um, of the act itself, we need some negotiation or the social agreement. So we need some more time. But Article 7, which is about incitement and prey, should be repealed. That was his position. From my point of view, of course, the civil society argue for the absolute abolishment of the national security law, but then once, and the Article 7 is the worst article among all, and once you abolish that Article 7, the other part of the, the NSA can be actually replaced with the criminal law because other criminals, um, the actions listed in other parts of the National Security Act, apart from Article 7, can be punished with criminal law. So if you nullify the Article 7, that means that we don't need NSA anymore. So I think first step is to, to abolish Article 7 of the NSA, then it will make more justification and legitimacy to entire abolishment of the law in the future. So let, let's cross our finger and let's expect that will happen in this um, administration. Thank you. Tim. <clears throat> okay, first I wanna say something about the national security law. Uh, there's, a, there's a man here in Guangzhou 
who started a trauma center uh, for victims and victims of the Kwanzaa massacre and and families of the the bereaved here in, in Kwangju. And it's a you know it's a center for people to deal with their PTSD basically and, and to deal with the horrors they still feel from what happened in 1980. And he's a very prominent person here in Guangzhou. And uh, he he uh, was prosecuted under the national security law. And uh, he, he was, he's now being uh, like, when you're convicted of something under the national security law, you have to report to the police all the time. And, and uh, he has kind of resisted, civilly resisted uh, that part of the law. And and he is being tried again soon uh, here in Guangzhou. So you know this this law is just a terrible draconian law uh, that's that's used basically to punish all. Just can you be used to punish almost any kind of dissent uh, when they just say you know what you're saying is sounds vaguely like what North Korea says. So I agree that this is this is something that really needs to be you know I hope that Korean people can address. And I'm I'm glad I didn't know that that part about about. Uh, uh, you know how he how he had how he had, Moon had said that about the law. Uh, so so the, the other the other question had to do with uh, uh, you know how can there be peace or reconciliation uh, as long as China and the U.S. are in the lead? Um, I think I think basically uh, you know I would take China out of that because you know I, I think China has a lot less influence in Korea than the United States does. Uh, I think that the United States has other aims here in, in Korea and the Korean Peninsula that we in, we in the United States must address. Uh, you know, the, 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 this, you know like Trump has been talking about, you know, making South Korea pay more for the military. You know, he floated this idea of making them pay for THAAD and this kind of thing. You know, as if, you know, we're, we're doing all South Korea a great favor by having our forces here and having our missiles here and so on. Well, you know, there is a treaty, there is an alliance between the United States and South Korea, uh, where the United States and South Korea, you know, the United States agrees to help South Korea if it's invaded by North Korea. But as we all know, the U.S. bases here are used far beyond Western Korea, and this this is a very critical place on the you know in Asia. It's the only place the U.S. has ground forces in Asia, the Asia mainland. Uh, the, the intelligence base of Pyongyang is used for you know regional intelligence. Uh, the the you know, as as Gayum was saying, you know Jeju Naval Base is you know part of these. Uh, uh, the, the U.S. ships are probably going to be calling there more unless you know we, we that can be stopped. Uh, but that's all part of a regional you know military uh, missile defense system. Also, the ships that go there are ships that are involved in missile defense. So. You know, South, the Korea Peninsula, the U.S. has this whole strategic focus on Korea as part of its regional focus. And I think that, you know, we, we in the United States really need to, to challenge that, you know, and look at the use of, look at the bases here. And, you know, this expansion of the airport is just an example. I mean, you, you know, we see in Okinawa, you know, the people, the masses of people from the, you know, governor on down struggling to stop the expansion of the U.S. Marine Base in Okinawa. And I think, you know, unless the, this, 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 if this air base comes to fruition in Jeju Island, uh, that's going to be another base. Uh, and so, you know, the U.S. has a huge role in, in this. And I, I think that, that we have to really start getting, a, you know, more of a focus on, on, you know, making, as I said earlier, you know, waking people up to this in the United States. Um, and, and, you know, I want to say one thing about, you know, the, the, the pol politics of the U.S. Uh, you know, I was thinking like, you know, okay, which groups could, could you know, really focus on on Korea and raise awareness? You know, I think you know, Women Cross DMZ has already done a lot of that. Uh, I think you know, Code Pink is already playing a big role, and Code Pink, uh, you know, to their credit, is has is taken up the Korean issue also, and a lot of people listen to them. I think that's very important. Um, but during the war scare here a couple of weeks ago, I was just appalled to see Bernie Sanders on, on CNN a couple times, you know, in endorsing basically Trump's, Trump's uh, policies on Korea and sounding as hawkish or even more hawkish than Trump was. And, I, you know, I, I remember posting on Facebook, you know, I've had it with Bernie Sanders. That he, you know, he's dead to me after this. 
And I got all this, you know, response, you know, how can you do this? You know, Bernie's a great guy. He needs to be educated. Well, you know, Bernie's been in the Senate for, you know, I don't know how long he's been in Congress for, you know, years and years and years. And if he's still saying this stuff, I don't know if he's within our reach to educate. And, you know, when, when you have people like that coming out and saying, you know, you know, basically, you know, coming out with this warlike, you know, from this guy is supposed to be, you know, the big representative of the U.S. left, and he is as warlike as Trump towards North Korea. And, and I think, you know, so that just shows you how far we have to go. Uh, so, you know, again, I get back into, into education, but I think, you know, China can play a very constructive role, I think, because they actually, you know, you know before this election, uh, the, the Chinese government had made some proposals like, you know, let's have a moratorium on North Korean nuclear and missile tests, and let's have a moratorium on U.S.-South Korean military exercises as a way to begin talks, to way to begin negotiations. And what was the first reaction from the U.S., from this, you know, South Carolina governor who was our U.N. representative? You know, she, she blasted this out of the, you know, in, within minutes. No, that's impossible. We're not going to do that. North Korea has to completely eliminate it's, you know, nuclear program first before the community talks. So, uh, you know, we're really far away from, from, from any kind of, you know, ability to, to, to negotiate with North Korea, I think. And, and I think the, you know, you know, I, I think the Chinese have made some sensible proposals. And my hope is that, you know, maybe, you know, Donald Trump seems to think uh, Premier Xi is like a really great guy and they eat chocolate cake together as they talk about, you know, bombing other countries. Uh, maybe the Chinese can have, you know, some influence on U.S. thinking, but I think we, the, the real question is American policy and how that can change. And I think we really need to support uh, and be careful and see how the U.S. begins to pressure uh, uh, President Moon and, and his government when they try to take steps toward reconciliation with, with, with North Korea. And, you know, as I keep saying in interviews and articles, this is their country. You know, it's, it's South and North Korea are part of the same nation. Uh, you know, it's not like just this is some, you know, random country that they're in conflict with. This is their country that was divided, uh, divided unfairly by the great powers in, in the end of World War II. And that the United States, when they occupied South Korea, they ruled it through a military government a country that was fought the Japanese. And, you know, and Japan was allowed to keep its own government. Uh, and they're the country that attacked us. So, you know, there's, there's so much history here and, and the U.S. attitude, as I wrote it a couple of weeks ago in The Nation, is just, you know, it's like Korea is like, you know, big brother, little brother, you know, whatever South Korea does, the, you know, whatever we do, South Korea does. And that, that's got to change. And, and I, I, I'm not sure, uh, how that's going to change. But, um, you know, once again, I just come down to, you know, basic education. If we have Bernie Sanders, you know, sounding so warlike, you know, we got a long way to go. Okay. I'm sorry for getting so worked up. I'm sorry <laughs> for getting so worked up. And I, 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 you know, I get really upset about this. <clears throat> It's understandable when so many Americans would support some kind of U.S. military strike without knowing the full history. Um, so we have like two more minutes left. So I'm sorry to leave such little time for the rest of the questions, but maybe we'll just um, hear quickly from Simone about, uh, and even Kayun if she wants at the end to chime in about labor issues and, um, and Doug to talk about the sanctions. Yeah, I'll just be quick, very quick. I think that with regard to labor issue, I have as most pessimistic view uh, on the pre previous uh, Roman administration, more more workers were repressed and arrested. And uh, so I don't really see the fundamentals changing. And uh, as long as because of the structural limitation by the uh, uh, imposed by neoliberalism, um, uh, the North Union is divided, as you know, and there's only the 10% the rate of unions. So I think Korean labor is, I, I think, is uh, really in the toughest time. So I don't really see that anything have changing uh, significantly on the President um, Moon Jae-in. Nevertheless, though, he did, though, he was attorney who practiced labor law, employment law, who, who helped uh, uh, laid off workers in the, uh, in the 1980s, and, uh, and he spent all his career there. So I think that 
and the human rights issue of labor will be improved, I believe. Uh, and the one last thing, which is totally separate, that the way I want to end it is with this thing. You know, the, uh, going back to the sort of a foreign policy issue and North Korea issue, as you know, Moon Jae-in is like a, will be like Korea's version of Angela Merkel. He's the, this is the first president who has uh, roots in North Korea. You know, his mom was his parents from North Korea. His mom, he his mom, ninety year old mother has aunt in North Korea, whom they saw uh, once when the, during the family reunion. So I think that. Uh, um, uh, this is very unique uh, moment, and uh, that we we should also, you know, in my mind, in a way, we should also sort of uh, uh, make this a very special story. You know, like uh, Korea's uh, Moon Jae-in, not in, in addition to all the, the electoral outcome, but also Moon Jae-in himself. So this is where I think that I would like to, I, 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 something that I will mention before the the end of the show. Great, thank you, and Doug. Just uh, very briefly. The sanctions are very, very serious. They are having very serious consequences uh, for Koreans. Um, I, I know that's true um, both in Europe and the US. The, uh, I met with um, some government officials uh, about a month ago who were talking about their strategy with regard to North Korea and their only strategy um, this is aside from the, the sane ones that didn't want to do a preemptive nuclear uh, attack on the, on the nuclear facilities. The, the sane ones were, were that the, their only idea was to increase the sanctions and do secondary sanctions against uh, companies in other countries that were trading with North Korea. We have eliminated Korea from the banking system. We have made it illegal for them to even ship um, minerals, coal, and other things um, to China. Uh, when you eliminate a country from the international banking system and you don't allow them to sell any of the things that they have, even if they are allowed to buy food and medicine, if those are unsanctioned, they're physically and fiscally incapable of doing that. Um, so I, I've talked about this with UN officials. Um, the last time that the UN did a similar uh, embargo was on Iraq in the 1990s uh, after the first Iraq war. And we know that the UN sanctions were responsible for the killing of at least a half a million Iraqi children. This is happening in North Korea now. Um, malnutrition um, among children and among elderly, um, uh, uh, medicines and hospitals, all of these are in short supply. We need to pressure the US government, we need to pressure the UN that they need to end the sanctions, they need to open dialogue. That is the only way forward. Thank you, Doug. And I'll hand it over to Ethan. Thank you, Christine. And, and thank you to each of our panelists, um, to Guy Yung Beck, to Tim Shork, to Simone Chun, and to Doug Hostetter for really absolutely uh, excellent presentations and so timely uh, today, uh, the day after the election um, for this conversation, a new South Korean president, prospects for peace on the Korean Peninsula. We thank all of you for joining us today live um, through uh, the Zoom webinar platform or through Facebook Live. Please continue to be in contact with um, all of us uh, through uh, Women Cross DMZ and the Fellowship of Reconciliation and each of our partner organizations. Um, and thanks for your continuing work, everyone, as grassroots advocates for social change, peace, nonviolence, freedom, and justice. Um, we wish you best regards, and again, uh, our greatest thanks to Women Across DMZ for organizing and putting this webinar together on its uh, Zoom platform. Thank you, Christine and Jacqueline. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you, everybody, for joining. And we'll um, we'll we'll post it on um, on YouTube so that it can be shared. And we'll just continue having these transnational conversations across boundaries. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Good night and good morning. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.